Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come and look into your word yet again and, and for today to, to look at what resurrection uh, means to each one of us. We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and help us to see the truth in your word and how you call us to live our life as we follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today is, we celebrate a, a really important event uh, in the life of the church. Uh, it's on our church calendar, but more important, the fact that we are all here this morning is because the resurrection means something uh, to each one of us. It's because of the resurrection that, that we are here to, today. Um, when you come to think about resurrection, uh, people have different views about the resurrection. Uh, I don't know if you read uh, on the online news on stuff. Uh, on Good Friday, there was an a interview where the, the chair of the Humanist Society of New Zealand was trying to say that as, as New Zealand matures, we need to get rid of all this religious festival uh, and the holidays that is centered around these religious festivals. Uh, for him, um, the resurrection was a myth. Uh, it's not something that happened. And so as, as, as New Zealand matures, we need to check out um, these religious holidays. And whilst holidays is good, he says, um, centering around religious festivals, holiday centering is, is a waste of time. And he even mentioned having innocent buns, having a cross on it is also <laughs> not uh, a good thing for the bun as well. So, you know, <laughs> uh, well, I love hot cross buns. So <laughs> anyway, so, so you have a lot of people who be believe that the, the resurrection is a myth. Uh, and, and there have been people who have tried to prove that the resurrection never happened. And, and uh, the good thing is that for some of them, as they do the research, they come to the point that they actually believe the resurrection has happened and they became Christians. A good example is this American reporter, Lee Strobel, um, who tried to prove that a resurrection did not happen. And the end result was that he became a Christian and he even wrote a book on why he believes the resurrection took place. But then there's others who say the resurrection is actually more of a faith or spiritual experience that Jesus never really rose from the dead, you know. It was just a faith or a spiritual experience that, that God, that Jesus was bringing uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the people that as we encounter the death of Christ and have our sins forgiven, all of us experience the spiritual resurrection. Uh, and, and one of the good advocates of this is, is Bishop Spong, who d doesn't believe that the resurrection took place. And in his book, he would say that even in that experience that Peter had walking with Jesus on the beach and where uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Uh, and Peter said, yes, I did. And Jesus says, go and feed my sheep. And Jesus said that three times. And for Bishop Spong, this was not a literal Jesus uh, walking with Peter, but Peter's spiritual encounter uh, with, with God. And it was like a prayer experience that Peter was having, uh, that Jesus wasn't really there. Uh, but Peter experiencing uh, the, the resurrection power at work in his life. So uh, it's more of a faith or spiritual experience. But for us as Christians, we believe it is a historical event. And it has to be a historical event because if Jesus Christ never rose from the dead physically, then our faith is in vain. That, that, that we are wasting our time uh, coming to church. And in fact, in this whole passage in Romans that we read, three times Paul uses the, the, the words, uh, we know or, or don't you know? Uh, because for Paul, it was a matter of fact that, that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and Paul would have hung out with the, the, the apostles, the disciples, who saw the resurrected Jesus. And over 500 people, Paul says, in 1 Corinthians, saw the resurrected Jesus. It, it couldn't have been an illusion. It couldn't have been something that uh, people just um, visualized. Uh, but it was a, a real resurrection of Jesus. And, and so in this passage in Romans, and we have been looking at Romans because the lectionary over the Lenten season focus on, on, on the book of Romans, and next week we go into the book of Acts as we continue looking at the lection, lectionary readings. But today 
it, in a sense, it sums up everything that we talked about uh, during the Lenten season. And, and three times Paul uses the word, we know or don't you know. And, and each time when he says that, he brings across this, this awe-inspiring truth that we need to grasp hold of as, as followers of Jesus. And, and the first truth that, that he brings across is, is, um, is this, found in Romans chapter 6 and verse 9. The first truth, Christ rose from the dead and will never die again. And, and that is what this, this verse is saying. He says, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The difference between Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection of, say, Lazarus is the fact that, that Lazarus at some point would have died. Uh, we don't have a 2,000-year-old man wandering around the world at this present moment. Lazarus died. <laughs> he died at some point. And, and so, so Lazarus, whilst he experienced resurrection for a short while, eventually he died. But, but Jesus, when he was rose from the dead, he never died again. This is so important for each one of us because Jesus didn't die again. He becomes the first fruits of all those who would then, be, would then rise from the dead. And, and even Jesus, when he was talking to uh, the family of Lazarus and with all the people that were gathered around the tomb of Lazarus, um, the, he he said, said that I'm the resurrection and, and the life. He who believes in me, yet he dies, will, will, will live again. And he who, never, who believes in me but never dies will continue to live. And so he was talking about the importance that his resurrection would mean for all of us. That he, because he rose again and would never die again, all of us has a chance to experience this resurrection life. Paul believed so much in the, the death and resurrection of Jesus that he says this in Romans 4 verse 25, he was delivered, he referring to Jesus, was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. What he's saying is this, that in the death of Jesus Christ, we have received forgiveness of sins However, it is important for, uh, for Jesus to rise from the dead because in rising from the dead, he can then have the power to declare us righteous before God. The Passion Translation puts it this way, Jesus was handed over to be crucified for the forgiveness of our sins and was raised back to life to prove the, that he had made us right with God. So when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, this, this whole concept of the resurrection was so important that Paul actually spent a, a chapter talking about this resurrection. And in chapter 15 of, of 1 Corinthians, Paul um, makes it a point to say, if Christ has not been raised, all these things would have happened. Firstly, our preaching is useless. <laughs> If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then we don't have a gospel to preach. We don't have a truth to declare. All our preaching is useless. Our faith is useless if Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. We are misrepresent, excuse me, misrepresenting God because we are saying that God raised Jesus from the dead when he actually didn't raise Jesus from the dead. So in other words, if Jesus Christ has not been raised, we are misrepresenting God. We are still in our sins. So our faith is futile, that if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, we are still dead in our sins, even though the shed blood of Jesus on the cross was shed for the forgiveness of sins. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, we, we don't have forgiveness of sins. Those who have died are lost. There is no hope to be with God forever. And, and on this beautiful Easter weekend, we are wasting our time coming to church. We might as well enjoy a long weekend somewhere else uh, because we should be pitied if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. This was so important to Paul that he stressed that Jesus rose from the dead never to die again is because of, of that in his resurrection, we have uh, the opportunity to also 
uh, rise from the dead and to live the resurrected life. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, as an emphasis of what he was talking earlier, but Christ, had, oops, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. And so we can know that this first truth, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and will never ever die again. And because of that, you and I can have forgiveness of sins, but also we can stand righteous before God because he can now give us this gift of righteousness that helps us to stand righteous before him. And because Christ has, has been raised from the dead, then uh, this is the flip side of, of what uh, Paul said would happen if Christ didn't rise from the dead. But because Christ has raised from the dead, the preaching of this good news is the only hope for this world. That, that, that as Paul would say in Romans, that the gospel is the power of God at work for those who, who believe, of, of giving us this gift of, of righteousness. Our faith is well-founded. Uh, in other words, that, that we have a, a, a rock-steady faith because Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. The apostles spoke what they knew was true. If, if the apostles actually stole the dead body of Jesus, would they have actually suffered and been persecuted and, and faced death for, for a lie? And the fact that they knew that Jesus rose from the dead, the apostles spoke with full confidence in the resurrected Savior. We can receive forgiveness of sin. We know for certain that those who died in faith will be with God forever. We do not need to be ashamed of following Christ. Uh, you know, we, 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 we are privileged to have been recipients of God's righteousness because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So that's the first thing, that Jesus historically and supernaturally rose from the dead and this is good news for, for you and I. But then the second truth is this. Through faith, we are united with Christ in his death and resurrection. And so now we're coming back to the early part of, of Romans 6. Uh, again, he says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may be, be raised from the dead. Sorry, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. So we, we started the reading this morning from verse 3, but if you went and, and looked at verse 1, Paul asked this rhetorical question. Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? In other words, if you're following the theme of Paul right through the book of Romans, what Paul is actually saying, should we keep breaking God's standard of righteousness in order that we can receive more and more grace? And of course, the answer he emphatically says is no. We don't keep sinning just to have more of God's grace. And, and so he then talks about this death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for you and I. That when Jesus died on the cross, we actually died with him. That each one of us, we have died to our old life. The life that was controlled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, and when Christ died, he took all our sins on the cross. He took all our old life on the cross and we were there with him, Paul says. Something significant by faith, we were also baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. So that when we rise again with Jesus Christ, we rise again as a new creation, a new person. The old has passed away, all things have become new, Paul would say. Uh, and, and so in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, by faith, we are also identifying with his death and resurrection. And so in the, in the Anglican church, in the, in the Christian church, we have two sacraments or ordinances, uh, baptism to represent the death and resurrection, uh, where we go into the water and come out again as, as a new person. So we are dying to our old life and we come up to a new, newness of life. 
The old has been washed away. The water doesn't change us. It's only a symbol. It's an act, whether we sprinkle, whether we immerse. It's an act of washing away of the old life. It's, it's to tell us that the old has passed away, that when we have died with Christ, we have died to the old way. So if, if we experience a physical death, for example, none of you have experienced it yet, <laughs> uh, or else you wouldn't be here, but, <laughs> but if you have experienced a physical death, you would be separated from the natural world. You no longer are connected to the natural world. And so when we have died with Christ, we are no longer connected to the old way of living that we are no longer breakers, if you like, of God's standard of righteousness, that we start afresh. Suddenly, the price for breaking God's standard of righteousness has been paid, and because we have died and rose again, we rise again no longer breakers of God's standard of righteousness. But not only that, God gives us His righteousness, so the only righteousness that meets God's standard of righteousness is Christ's righteousness. Every one of us have a righteousness that have broken God's standard. And as we rise from the dead and become a new creation, we stand totally clean, but God knows us too well and knows that we're going to break his standard of righteousness again. So what does he do? He gives us his righteousness. So that when God looks at us, when God looks at you, God looks at me, he doesn't see my righteousness or your righteousness, he sees Christ's righteousness. That's, that's the beauty of grace. The, 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 the vilest sinner who truly repents, who receives God's gift of righteousness, no longer is seen as a sinner, but as a saint. And so we, we rise into this newness of life. And we are now a new creation, given that gift of righteousness. And so when we look at one another, we, see, we do not see sinners, but we see saints who have been restored and redeemed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and have received God's gift of righteousness. And that's why... Uh, Paul can, can write in two places, Colossians 2. Um, he says, he goes on to say, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So again, that identification. Uh, Galatians 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And so when he says, clothe yourself with Christ, what he's actually saying is you have clothed yourself with the righteousness of Christ. So you and I, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, have clothed ourselves with Christ's righteousness. And so we no longer need to sin like the old way of, of we used to sin. We are now the righteousness of Christ. We, when God looks at us, he sees Christ's righteousness. God sees us as, as people who are worthy of living with him for all eternity. Not because of our own righteousness, which is like filthy rags before God, but because of Christ's righteousness in us. And then, the, the, uh, finally, the third truth, that, that, that we no longer are slaves to sin, but free to live in righteousness. And again, the third time, he, Paul writes, For we know that the old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And then uh, he goes on in verses 11 and 12. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. So remember, we talked a little bit about the two laws at work a couple of weeks ago, the law of sin and death and, and, the, and the law of the spirit. 
And when we died and rose again with Christ, we have been set free from the law of sin and death, and we are able to receive God's Holy Spirit. And this is something Paul, uh, remember Paul is now writing after Jesus have, res was, have been resurrected and the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church. And, and he, he knows right now that when he talks that, that we have the power not to sin, he's not talking about it in, that we are trying to resist sin in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit that, that God has given us. In John 16, when Paul was, not Jesus, was talking about the Holy Spirit. He says this, Very truly I tell you, for it is your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate referring to the Holy Spirit will come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then going on in verses 12 and 13, I have much to say, more that you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell what is yet to come. So Jesus was, was talking about the Holy Spirit that is to come. And he was telling the disciples, look, I need to go back to my Father, because if I don't go back to the Father, this Holy Spirit of truth that is there for your good, for your benefit, will not come. But because I'm going back to the Father, I will send the Holy Spirit. And when I send the Holy Spirit, He will guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He will not lead us into lies. He leads us into truth. And that truth allows us to meet God's standard of righteousness. And that is what you and I need to live this resurrected life that God has raised us with Christ, uh, and we are now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Paul will say that in Ephesians. And God has made available this Holy Spirit, and we'll talk about it in, when, on, when we come to Pentecost. But right now, as we end this message on the resurrection, I want to encourage you to, to realize that you are not the old person that you used to be. You are not the person who struggled with the flesh, who struggled with, the, with sin, who struggled with the world, who struggled with, with the devil. You are a new person, set free. You have died to your old way of living, and you have been ris risen with Christ to a new way of living. And you have the gift of righteousness in you. You are declared righteous before God. You may feel guilty or condemned by things you have done in the past, and God is saying there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to feel condemned about things you have done in the past. You are a new creation, and you have God's gift of righteousness in you. And God has given you His Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to help you live a life that glorifies Him. And so, as we think of um, Easter, let our response to the resurrection of Christ be a life of faith, righteousness, and love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for each person here this morning. And Lord, you know where each person is at uh, in their walk with you, in their journey with you. You know the guilt and condemnation that people feel about things of the past that, that have kept them trapped. Um, and Lord, I pray this morning that chains will be broken, that whatever condemnation and guilt people feel, that Lord, you would break that that chains and give them the sense of freedom, freedom because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on each one of us. And I pray this morning, Lord, for anyone who is struggling with, with sin, struggling with weaknesses, struggling with habits and things that, that keep them trapped, I pray this morning, I pray, Father, that you would just give them a sense that uh, of knowing that you are at work in their lives. You are the one who said, the work that I've started in you, I will bring it to completion. And so, Lord, I pray this morning for anyone who is struggling. Lord, I pray that you would lift that guilt, lift that condemnation, and, and help them to know that they are loved by you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in helping them to experience the, 
excuse me, the righteousness that you have put in them, to, that they are clothed with Christ's righteousness. And whilst we are eyes are closed, if, if there are anyone, we have a, a visitors here, but we have various people uh, on that journey with, with God at different stages in their life. And, and this morning on, on Resurrection Sunday on Easter, I want to give an opportunity to anyone who, you, you may have given your life in the past to God, you may have uh, dedicated yourself to God, but you know you have been struggling in this journey. And, and this morning, I want to give an opportunity to say, Lord, I, I want to mean business with you today. I, I want to, to accept this gift of righteousness that you have given, and I want to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And if that's you this morning, I just ask you to raise your hand and put it down, so, and I would like to pray with you. So is there anyone here that wants to receive God's gift of righteousness and, and wants to, to, to be a, a committed follower of Christ? Yes, thanks. Anyone else? Thanks. Okay, let me pray. So, Father, you've seen this couple of hands that were, were raised as, as, uh, for those that, that are wanting to, to take this journey with you seriously. I, I pray, Lord, that you would just strengthen them, encourage them, and affirm them uh, as one whom you love. Thank you, Lord, as, as Shavi sang this morning, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see that, that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ made the grace available to each one of us. And for those that have reached out, Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen them in their grace. And for the rest of us in our Christian journey, Lord, help us to keep pressing on with you, relying on your Holy Spirit to help us and guide us, uh, and to know that when we stumble and fall, we can come to you to seek your forgiveness. Uh, you, because, Lord, you are a forgiving God. And so, Lord, thank you for the grace of forgiveness, the grace of righteousness, and the grace of your Holy Spirit to help us in that great Christian journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.